Um, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our two, two, 2024 Joint Federal Court IFA session. Uh, on behalf of uh, IFA, I would like to firstly thank the Federal Court for its continued support of IFA. Uh, as you may know, IFA is the largest non for profit tax association in the world. It's in over 80 countries and it has about 13,000 members. And those members include judges, in house tax, ex tax ex executives, government, OECD, and UN officials, uh, tax lawyers, tax accountants, academics, and students. Quite a diverse association. And if you are not a member and want to know more about it, please contact us or join us. Um, the session today has attracted great interest. I think we have in, in the room and online more than 350 people, most of them from Australia. Uh, and indeed, in recent times, we have seen a number of important international tax cases making the way for the, for, uh, for the courts. Those, these cases are inherently complex in many respects. And this underscores the importance of case preparation and case management. In particular, uh, assisting the court to deal with the case as efficiently and as practically as possible. Moreover, a good case preparation may assist clarifying each, each party's case, which in turn may result in narrowing the issues or reaching a resolution by agreement. We have a great panel to discuss this issue today from three core perspectives. Shafiz Hesp was appointed to the federal court on 27 April 2022. Shafiz Hesp commenced her career at Madison's when she specialized in income tax. From 2012, Justice Hesp was a lecturer at the University of Melbourne. In 2017, she was appointed as a part-time senior member of the Administrative Appeals Tribunal and was appointed as a senior counsel in 2021. In 2023, Justice Hesp was appointed a deputy president of the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. From the ATO, Nitin Galati, who is assistant commissioner in the international and private business structures, divisions of the ATO's tax council network. Nitin worked on the appeal to the federal court and the special leave application to the high court in the Glencore transfer pricing litigation, and also co-authored the ATO's decision impact statement for that case. He's involved in the Singtel litigation and was involved in the minor litigation. Prior to his role in TCN, Nitin uh, was the director of the independent review function in the ATO, in the ATO's RDR area. Apart from his litigation work, Nitin regularly provides technical and strategic advice to ATO case teams on complex audits, rulings, and objections that involve part for a DPT, and transfer pricing. And Carmen McLuhan. Uh, Carmen leads Minter Allison's tax controversy team she has over 25 years' experience managing large and complex tax controversy matters at the risk review and audit stage, stages and in the conduct of tax litigation. Carmen is responsible for the management and conduct of major tax litigation cases on behalf of the ATO and has been on the ATO's tax technical panel of legal service providers since 2007. She also represents large corporates in their disputes against the ATO and applies her insights into ATO's processes and decision making to design strategies for the effective management of clients' tax disputes issues. So I think you all agree that we have a great panel to discuss issues today. And if I may start with you, Justice Hesp, if you could please provide an overarching comment on the topic that we are discussing today. Thank you, Niv. Assisting the court begins with understanding who your audience is. As fundamental as that is, the real audience is not your client, it's not the public gallery. For a barrister, it's not your instructing solicitor. It's that one individual sitting up there alone who is charged with responsibility for de deciding and determining issues in dispute. So to help that individual, you need to enable them to understand what are the real issues in dispute? What are the real differences between the parties that need to be determined? In anti-avoidance in anti cases in particular, the real issues 
flow from each of the party's case theory. And what do I mean by that? So from the Commissioner's side, what the court really wants to understand is what is the Commissioner's real beef with what the taxpayer has done or not done? And why? From the taxpayer side, the court wants to understand what happened and what was the commercial and factual context in which that happened. From that foundation, you can then identify with more precision what are the legal issues in dispute and what are the factual issues in dispute. In terms of factual issues, what are the factual findings that you want that individual to make and where in the evidence does that individual find support for those factual findings? From a legal or principle perspective, what are the legal principles which you say apply and where in the authorities, whether that be the legislation or the cases, do you find support for those legal principles? But bear in mind that that person sitting up there hasn't lived and breathed the case like you have for months and in some cases even years. They come to it cold and they rely upon you to guide them through the material, overwhelming that individual with large swaths of irrelevant or material that's just tangentially relevant does not assist, it doesn't assist your, you and it certainly doesn't assist them. So to assist the court, begin by sitting and standing in the shoes of the judge and think about what it is you want that person to do. Good Justice has been. You can hear, I think your comments are from the commission. Uh, sure, I mean, I think I uh, agree with everything Justice has just said. Um, I guess in terms of the Commissioner's perspective, um, to build on what some, some of what Her Honour said, we are looking, I guess, from, you know, taxpayers to provide us with information in a timely way so that maybe we don't even get to litigation if there's other ways of resolving the dispute. Um, quite often, I guess, we, we find um, we do get information in a more piecemeal approach. Now, that, there can be good reasons for that, but sometimes um, that isn't the case. But it, in a similar way to what Her Honour was saying, um, ultimately, from a Commissioner's perspective, we have, you know, um, whether it's earlier on in the case or later on in the case, we have, say, a risk hypothesis or maybe after that you've had assessments issued and you've actually had a position articulated. But either way, we're looking for more than just assertions. We're looking for actual evidence to back up um, what is being asserted. And quite often that's, I guess, you know, a key piece of information that's either not there or it's being supported by other assertions or, you know, a narrative but without any sort of evidence that we think might demonstrate it. So uh, I guess um, the other thing I, we would say is, um, yeah, a bit like what Arona was saying earlier, sometimes um, if you can present facts as neutrally as possible, that's the most helpful, even from the ATO's perspective, rather than, I guess, another... Um, sort of approach where you might have more of a narrative where, you know, certain things are more skewed towards a certain conclusion. That can also be unhelpful, again, because you might get into a dispute about, you know, well, where do you put emphasis, what facts are relevant, rather than getting into the nub of the issue, which is, okay, you're saying you did certain things for commercial reasons, what actually backs that up? Like, you can, there's a lot of bells and whistles that can be attached to it, but ultimately that's what we're trying to also understand. Um, because, you know, if that is made out, then obviously, um, in an anti-avoidance case, for example, then that wouldn't apply. But yeah, I mean, it's not like the ATO is necessarily looking to litigate things um, uh, where, you know, the evidence shows otherwise. But it, quite often for us, it is a challenge in getting some of that material. Maybe yeah, just click on that. From your perspective, what could the taxpayer fair do better or worse in terms of engaging with the commission? Yeah, sure. Um, I guess a couple of things. Um, and from my perspective and my experience, the ones that have, you know, had been able to cut through the noise in terms of uh, being able to get to a more efficient and, and practical outcome, sometimes 
just as a question of engagement from you know the right people at the taxpayer engaging with the tax office more directly, um, particularly in the case of multinationals, we do see a lot of scenarios where um, you know there's uh, whether it's interest or you know directions from overseas, but we don't actually get to engage directly with those decision makers. Where that's happened, we would usually get a better outcome. Also, um, transparency and I guess a relationship of trust. Obviously, if we ask for information and we're provided without having to sort of go through formal notices, et cetera. Much better for everyone involved. Um, equally, where we do ask for information and, you know, um, a reasonable response is provided, much better again because we don't then get into a back and forth about, you know, information not being provided or um, information being sort of selectively provided. So I think, again, what I would say is, and don't always just um, think about what the commission is asking you if you think, because we don't know the full pool of information that's out there. That's, I guess, the information disadvantage the commissioner has. And so if we ask about something and the taxpayer thinks there's other information that's relevant to the question that we haven't asked for, um, it would be in the interest of the taxpayer to provide that as well, because that should assist in, again, completing that factual picture. And also, again, um, perhaps even show, uh, getting the taxpayer to be able to show that, you know, they had those reasons and the evidence to support um, what they were putting to us. So clarifying and sticking to the issues, Carmen, your perspective? Well, I'll, I'll speak from the taxpayer's perspective. And taxpayer, um, from day one, uh, minus one, has... Uh, faces many, many challenges in um, engaging with the ATO where the ATO is developing a hypothesis um, or, or in relation to a particular tax position that the taxpayer has or, you know, what, when the ATO wants to review the a transaction or, um, structure or, or means by which the taxpayer is taking a, a tax position. The difficulty... Um, sticking to the issues is um, the taxpayer has the onus of proof, but the taxpayer in doing, in having an onus of proof uh, has to understand what case it is answering or, or what issues it, it, it needs to um, uh, pro uh, prove and then what conclusions with respect to the provisions of the legislation that the ATO may apply. And the difficulty of that is sticking to the issues is um, before you get to the to, to court, the issues are developing, and that's the difficulty because the engagement that occurs before in, before you get anywhere near court or even before you get to an ass amended assessment mm -hmm. is that a taxpayer is particularly in the larger matters. A taxpayer is in um, on this usually very long process of ATO information gathering, and the ATO will not confirm its hypothesis or the case that the taxpayer has to answer until it goes through a prolonged and sometimes may seem endless process of information gathering. So sticking to the issues is a very difficult one for the taxpayer because it takes a significant amount of time to get to the issues and that's where along the way I, I, I think there's a lot more that can be done in the communication and engagement with the ATO and also where the ATO is uh, needs to be, I think, clearer uh, and more detailed in what the issues are and why the ATO is concerned with particular facts or, or if there are gaps in the facts, assist the taxpayer to um, address the issues that the ATO has. I acknowledge that sometimes it is difficult. Some taxpayers may not be as forthcoming as the ATO expects, but it's also um, a, a huge frustration and an ongoing frustration where even a taxpayer provides a, a significant response or a response to um, 
and detail RFI, um, often what happens is the next RFI comes along without people, both parties, stopping to take stock. Well, where did this get us in terms of the issues? Have we addressed anything? Do we need to continue with all of these issues? And if we do, what is it that about what it is we've provided to you thus far that hasn't hit the mark? And I think the engagement, um, and, and this applies to both parties, really do, does, I think, need to um, address some of uh, what I believe is a lack of um, meaningful and, and focused um, engagement. And the other aspect of this is, too, that the whole process of developing the, the ATO's development of the hypothesis and fact gathering and getting to know the facts um, is done through the lens of the ATO seeking the information, which is also done from the point of view of the development of the ATO's hypothesis. It is extremely important that, a, that on the taxpayer side, quite apart from the um, the lens through which the ATO is examining the issues, that the taxpayer sits back and has a really good look at, well, if we were to front a judge, uh, what's the story we're going to tell, having regard to what we think are the, the provisions that the ATO is going to apply to us, what are the facts, and how does that prove the conclusion that supports our case? Quite apart from the questions that tax office is asking. And I think um, they're the, the challenges because at the end of the day, the onus of proof is on the taxpayer. So the two, the two approaches um, really do need to take place in parallel, um, but they don't seem always to come together in a meaningful way where that, that engagement by the parties can sit down and look at, okay, well, where are we at now? We've had this round of massive information gathering. Where has it led us? Have we addressed any of these issues? And I think a lot more of that focus needs to occur. So it's very difficult sticking to issues. Um, so if it's fair to say that more can be done um, so the parties can, when the parties get to court issues, they clarify and distill, as Justice has mentioned. Um, I think that there is some sense, maybe it's not accurate, but some sense that in the last few, past, past few years, engagement, mainly in the largest segment of the market, has been more difficult. The meaningful engagement that Carmen was mentioned, that was referring to. Uh, yeah, would you agree with that, uh, Nathan? Um, I would. Again, speaking from my own perspective and by the cases that I've seen, I'd say that's still more the exception rather than the norm. Um, to Carmen's point, um, I, as a general comment, I think it's probably right that, you know, we should be able to have a point in time discussion about um, the relevant issues and the relevant evidence and where both parties sit, both in terms of whether it's a disagreement in terms of there's, you know, not enough, that there's gaps in the evidence or whether it's a discussion about um, okay, there's this different takes on what the conclusions are from that evidence. Um, but that needs to happen at a point in time where, I guess, for, you know, like uh, whether tax, taxpayers appreciate it or not, sufficient information has been gathered. Because as I was alluding to earlier, the commissioner is at a information disadvantage. So, you know, we're not asking information just for the sake of asking information either. We're also not aware of the full pool of information. So as Carmen was saying earlier, if there is information that's relevant to the issues or the case, um, but we haven't asked for it, it might actually be in a taxpayer's interest to provide it to us to short circuit some of this as well. But I, as a general point, I do agree that there should be a point in time that's suitable well before litigation where some of these dis, um, aspects can be you know, discussed much more thoroughly, if you like. But it does, again, depend on you know, engagement and trust and all of those issues that we were talking about earlier um, from both sides. Quite often we, again, believe it or not, we get hit with, you know, here's an expert report, you know, it's 300 pages, basically take it or leave it, rather than any sort of meaningful discussion about, okay, well, what are the inputs into the report? What's the data relied on? You know, what, um, 
how much of it is um, someone's professional opinion versus, you know, um, a dispute perhaps about the inputs that went in or the data relied on, those sorts of things, because, yeah, you, you end up in this sort of expert off in a way where, you know, you're just trading reports, but no one's actually really discussing in any meaningful way the content of those reports. Um, in terms of, you know, whether or not engagement sort of become generally more difficult in the large market space, I, again, speaking from my own perspective, I don't think so. I've still seen that more as the exception rather than the norm. Um, and I guess the only other thing I would say is um, a lot of these transactions are getting more and more complicated as well in a way, um, sometimes for obvious reasons, but, you know, um, sometimes for us at least, we're trying to understand why, for our argument's sake, you know, 51 steps were taken on a day. Um, it, it, believe it or not, it takes a while for us to understand that, even though it might be obvious for the people that actually entered into the transaction because, um, you know, they would have got advice before structuring, et cetera, for years and then actually implementing it. But for us to piece together some of that puzzle can be difficult at times. I'm going to touch on one more issue that was raised recently in Milan, and that's the, and again, question to you, I'm sorry. <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> it's the reliance on the burden of proof by the commissioner and whether you think there is room for different approach, especially after the comments by the judge there in relation to Section 37N of the Federal Court or, or, of Australia Act. Yeah. Uh, I'm not talking about this case specifically, but that in general, I mean, whether there is room to sometimes we think or well, take less than a strict, a less strict approach to the better. Yeah, approach. sure. I mean, look, again, as a general comment, we don't have any, you know, disagreements with what Her Honor said there. Um, we have model litigant obligations as well. It's not like, you know, we um, run cases just saying onus oh, approved and sort of put our hands up. Um, I think the difficulty for us as an administrator is sometimes, particularly in these complex cases, the issues are not just one about what, what is, you know, what is the documentary evidence showing or what is the transactional evidence showing. It's always um, a bit more than that and it's about things like, um, you know, why were certain decisions made or, or what other things were considered or what other options were considered. And those are sort of qualitative things that, um, again, a lot easier for us to unpack if there's not just assertions made but sort of evidence given. And although I agree again, and this goes back to what I was saying earlier, I think there's a, um, there would be an ideal point in time discussion where we can maybe thrash some of that more out with a more willing and engaging taxpayer to do that because... Um, sometimes it is just a difference in opinion in terms of what the evidence shows in terms of the conclusions you draw from it. Um, other times it is, look, there are gaps in the evidence because you've said this, but there's not, nothing actually backing it up. Right? So um, I don't think we as an organisation are, you know, just going, well, here's the hypothesis see in court. I don't think that's the case at all, right? But uh, equally for us, um, we are looking for the same things the court is in a way, which is, okay, you said this, what's the evidence backing it up? Sometimes the answer is it's not there because, you know, either the transaction's too old or, or whatever it is. And that's then, you know, a matter of judgment calls whether we, we think we accept without, you know, without any sort of, uh, if you like, concrete evidence, um, certain assertions or not. Um, and that's a case-by-case -case judgment call. Sorry. Oh, I think we have um, point discuss specifically about the court's comments in Milan. So I think I might give you our perspective from, from that, on that. And that is, um, this highlights the very thing that I've been talking about in terms of the meaningful engagement that needs to happen. Um, I think, well, in that case, there were years and years of information gathering. And um, it did take until I think nine days into the hearing where um, the tax office articulated exactly what issues it had with the facts that the, the taxpayer had presented. And that was essentially the first time that we had heard that or the taxpayer had heard that in the context of a hearing and after Her Honour had requested that that information be provided uh, after the commissioner had, had said that the taxpayer was going to be put to proof. And this is the implication of, yes, of course, of the owner's proof. Uh, the client had put 
uh, the taxpayer had put um, facts before the court um, and still were not sure of what it was exactly about the onus of proof that we had not satisfied leading up to assessments, objection, or even then the hearing. And that's the point I think that um, really needs to be looked at in the whole continuum of ATO taxpayer engagement uh, because whether, and I'm talking uh, from now even both sides of the fence, uh, it, it has to be, it cannot be that that the commissioner can keep saying that, oh, we're going to put the taxpayer to proof, but we have provided the facts. So what is it about those facts that we haven't proved or the, or the conclusions we haven't proved or supported? And um, that is what I think would really help not only the taxpayer much before a hearing, but also the court. And um, I think this was a good example of uh, where that focus would, would could have you know potentially prevented even a litigation occurring. However, um, and I think that's uh, and again uh, that's also incumbent on the taxpayer to be forthcoming with the relevant information. Uh, we had the the taxpayer had the onus of proof. Those facts were were before the court, but um, it took a very, very long time before we understood what it was. And it turned out, I think, we are, we disagreed on two points, or two areas of, of fact, uh, and Her Honour, um, of course, found that the taxpayer had satisfied the onus. So I think that very... Uh, case does highlight the issues that should be addressed along the way and could make um, the process and also whenever something does get to court or hopefully avoids getting to court but then if it does get to court really reduce it to those issues that, that absolutely need to be uh, before a judge. Can I just... Um make some comments about that only because initially um, I wasn't talking about the specific case but um, I was asked a specific question about the specific <laughs> that's okay um, as I was saying earlier I don't think we we have any issues with what her honor said more generally about you know the obligations and so forth on the commissioner I guess I would highlight two things um, her honor prefaced her comments by noting that this was a unique case in that there was hardly any lay evidence, there was only documentary evidence. Um, and then she commented on the fact that the Commissioner was asked to respond to a narrative that um, was, you know, neutral and not biased in any way or presenting any particular conclusions. But a few paragraphs later, when she said she compared the two narratives, you know, <laughs> prepared by both parties, there wasn't actually that much difference between what the documents stated, but the differences lay in things like emphasis, characterisation, what inferences should or shouldn't be drawn, and characterisation, probably not surprising given that it was a par for a dispute. And again, I disagree. I think Her Honour pointed out four or five areas of factual differences that she then made her own findings on um, and you know, proceeded with her analysis there. So I, again, going back to what I was saying earlier, I think, um, and maybe Carmen's right here, I wasn't involved prior to the litigation, whether or not there was opportunities well before the case got to court to have some of these discussions. But, you know, where there is evidentiary gaps, um, I think we can ask the court to make adverse inferences and the court can obviously decline to make those inferences. That's obviously part of its role. But I think what um, we would respectfully disagree with Her Honour there was that it was a neutral narrative that was being prevented. Um, to us to accept or comment on. Um, it wasn't, yeah, I think... The, the facts that were put before the court were done in a neutral way without, advocate, without advocacy. So... Um, it also then say when she compared the two narratives of the parties, that wasn't entirely the case. So I think I don't know that we need to relitigate the case here, yeah. but I, I guess I was just providing our perspective. Yeah, and no, fair enough. But the, the, the point being, I think, in, in this discussion is it highlights um, that 
the uh, the focus or, or much more focus needs to be had um, along the way on what information is being provided and at the various stages where information is being provided um, rather than unfortunately which happens and I understand the ATO has its reasons for doing this that um, no sooner than you're responding to um, a request or a notice that you then get the second or third or fourth without having an understanding or, or an engagement about well, where are we at with these facts now and how can we address any, are there, how can we put aside some concerns or address, have we addressed any and what's, what's the balance of what needs to occur and where the direction needs to go. And, and that really should be the essence of the engagement uh, on, think, on behalf of both parties. And, and I think we, we have discussed, I mean, I think we have quite a broad consensus that can be, the process can be better before mm -hmm. we even get to court, either to narrow the issues or to find a resolution. But uh, yeah, even, even on, and sometimes it's not easy in terms of the engagement of facts and experts and evidence, we get to that. Um, but I think that we can stop that discussion on that particular case now. Uh, and maybe um, we'd like to move to the next because we have a lot to cover today. Probably one thing is guaranteed we will not cover everything we wanted to cover. But the next question, uh, Javis, has if you would be happy to comment generally on transfer pricing litigation and what cases should get to court, what cases maybe should not get to court, and how could the party do that? Um, transfer pricing cases, in many instances, are fact cases. If there is a real issue about the nature or character of the transaction that's been entered into, that seems to me to be an appropriate matter for a judge to decide. If there's a dispute about the construction of the legislation or a provision in a treaty, that too seems to me to be an appropriate matter for a judge to decide. But if there's no real dispute about the character of the transaction that's been entered into, and there's no real issue of legal principle there, you can always confect one, but if there's no real issue there, <laughs> You need to step back and ask yourself, is a judge the most appropriate person to decide a question of what is ultimately a question of price? And if what you're doing is asking a judge to choose between two experts, the judge will do it. But the other option is for the parties to nut out a deal because if the fight is really, really ultimately about a number, isn't it in the party's best interest to try to work out what is the number both parties can live with, albeit not happily, but you can live with it. When you put expert evidence before a court, judge will decide between experts on the basis of matters such as the level of expertise, and often, if satisfied that both experts are equally well qualified, step back and look at the assumptions that have underpinned the expert's report and will determine the case based on whether they feel those assumptions have or have not been made out. It rarely comes down to a judge going methodically step by step through some calculation or formula to work out which bits they agree with and which bits they don't. So I think from a practical point of view, if your fight is really about a number, maybe things like perhaps agreeing on a third party independent expert and seeing if you can agree with what that third party independent expert has come up with. That might be a more appropriate way of dealing with a fight if the fight is really and truly about a number. Thanks. Nitin, having got to what Justin has just said, and I think most disputes about just the number do get resolved and don't end up in court. Um, 
So from you, you're, given your experience at the ITO, you probably have exposure to, to a broad variety of cases where transfer pricing issue, disputes about the number or the range do get resolved. Are you happy to share those experiences or the way sure. parties have agreed? Yeah, I mean, look, um, we've had what, four, maybe five cases through the courts in the last 10 or 12 years about transfer pricing. So, you know, as a sort of indicator of what that proportion looks like, there's probably been hundreds, if not thousands, of cases where transfer pricing has either been considered or applied and either, the, you know, not pursued or resolved, depending on um, where we are. So it's not like the majority of transfer pricing cases are getting to court. I think what makes them unique and difficult for everyone is that it's not just your usual mix of law and facts. There's sort of an overlay of economics and expert evidence on top of all of that. And as I was alluding to earlier, I think um, it really depends on the appetite of both parties to, to, to try and resolve these cases. Um, the... We've had cases where the courts have accepted expert evidence, such as, you know, when call, we've had cases like Singtel now where, you know, the expert evidence has started being put to one side in favour of other evidence. So it's always a little bit of a gamble in terms of, you know, um, knowing what a court might think of certain expert evidence from both parties. And ideally, if it is just a dispute about price, you should be able to reach an outcome. Of course, that will depend on both parties' expectations of what a reasonable outcome is. But as I was alluding to earlier, I think it would be really helpful if in these discussions it's not just trading expert reports where um, even if it can't be the experts themselves, but where someone from both sides can talk about where the differences in opinion, even within the expert opinion, actually lie. Is it a matter of, as I was saying, you know, data relied on inputs? Is it actually a disagreement in professional judgment and expertise? The latter might be, you know, something that you can't necessarily then... Um, at least if you know that what, what aspects are where it's a difference in professional judgment, then you can make your own judgment call about you know, litigation risk, et cetera. But where it is a difference about um, different assumptions being made or different data being relied on, perhaps that can be more thoroughly worked through so that those differences fall away if possible. And you mentioned that, you know, and it's true that hundreds, hundreds of chance of pricing disputes about the number or the range do get resolved if they never get to litigation. In your experience, whether they get resolved at the audit stage, the objection stage, is it a mixed bag? I think it's a mixed bag, and it largely goes back again to that engagement point. You know, um, there are times where um, things proceed to objection and get resolved there because what I was talking about earlier happens at that stage rather than at the earlier stage. But there's plenty of cases that get resolved at audit, and even before that in... You know, these days the client engagement group does sort of reviews before they even get to audits and there are cases that get resolved at the review stage before even proceeding to audit. And again, I think it just comes down to the appetite of both sides to yeah, see if they can reach a resolution that's not going through the litigation. Um, and then, you know, the approach they take to try and actually um, do that. And if we, in the realm of transit pricing, you know, one of the issues... Another question for you, if that's okay, Jeff, if you have to, is experts. Um, and a very broad question, open question, is what may be helpful, what may be less helpful uh, <laughs> when we do the experts. It all comes essentially back to what we started with, which is you're less likely to lead unhelpful or irrelevant evidence if you are very careful about focusing on the real issues in dispute. Leading expert evidence just for the sake of countering the other side's expert evidence is not generally helpful if neither expert is expressing an opinion on an issue that is of real relevance to the court. You just end up with experts at 20 paces. Um, the thing about experts is you need to be very careful about identifying what is the expert's real area of expertise, what is the expert being asked to express an opinion on, and is that area within that expert's real area of expertise? Is the expert applying a methodology that reflects expertise at all? Or are they undertaking an exercise that is really one that a layperson is undertaking? And then you need to step back and look at the assumptions that the expert has made. Those assumptions may be explicit or they may be implicit. 
And it's generally at that assumption stage that expert evidence tends to be either accepted or rejected. Because if the assumptions underlying the report are not made out, or they are inconsistent with the statutory regime, or they're inconsistent with other facts, the expert evidence gets rejected and in the taxpayer's case, by default, they lose. That doesn't necessarily mean that the Commissioner's expert has been accepted. It just means that the taxpayer hasn't discharged their onus. When it comes to expert evidence, I think it is wise for all parties to expect that the court will require, at some point, a joint expert report, which clearly sets out the matters on which the experts agree and the matters on which they disagree and why. And although that sounds pretty fundamental, it's rise to another issue which is it's very hard to get that joint expert report if the experts haven't expressed opinions on the same question. So agreeing the question that is to be put to the expert, even if you can't agree on the assumptions underlying that question, is a critical step in making sure that the expert evidence is useful. There is a huge element of common sense involved but in the heat of battle and in this idea that if somebody's led five experts, we must have six, you lose sight of really what it is that you're asking that person sitting up there all alone to do. And that is where it all becomes a big mess. Thanks, Carmen. Any comments on that? Oh, I, I um, agree entirely and I, I think that careful consideration needs to be given quite apart from the question that the expert is being asked. It has to have, um, it's got to give some assistance to the issue that's being uh, dealt with by the court or considered by the court. And um, I think that's where the, the, the visibility or the relevance falls down where it's not clear uh, whilst the expert may have expertise and they may even be asked to assume certain things, they really have to be asked the right question that's going to assist the court and uh, in relation to, to the, the, the test in the legislation that, that's being applied. And, um, you know, without, of course, then you have to manage um, the way that's done so that it's not... Um, leading the witness or in any way influencing that, that outcome. However, um, you know, very careful consideration needs to be given to whether or not you need an expert to actually um, assist in the proof of um, a, a fact or uh, uh, rely on an opinion to, to prove that um, something was more, you know, was um, appropriate in a, in a commercial sense. In, in light of what the taxpayer had done and the way they structured a transaction or, or something of that nature. But again, the expert needs to have the expertise, the relevant expertise to, to comment on that or give, give a, an opinion that's going to assist the court. Um, again, um, one of the things we were discussing earlier today um, with, with Britain um, is whether at some point even during um, a, you know, the pro if the matter is in litigation and as you're preparing during the case management hearings, whether there is some uh, room for supervision by the court around uh, expert uh, or the number, you know, if they see a large number of experts in a case or whether there's some check-in. But that really is, I think, it does come down to the parties applying common sense as to whether the evidence is really going to assist with the issue that needs to be decided. Um, and that um, is not always uh, as easy uh, as it may sound. I don't think it does sound easy. Uh, and also finding the right expert to assist. And, um, and again, you should, it's, you know, I recommend not settling for an expert that you think may hit the mark. It, it's really important to 
um, find someone that is going to actually be able to give an opinion that's going to assist in in what in the decision that has to be made about um, what it is that's before the court. But again, uh, in in relation to to having one expert and not, and then you know opposing expert um, by the, the commissioner that is giving different views. Uh, again, that's another area where engagement um, between the parties can occur about how there can be some consensus, even you know, before you get to court, maybe through some other independent expert. Again, we're beating up the experts, but uh, you know, again, I think there is a lot of room for engagement between the parties further refining the issues, do we really need to go to this extent to convince the ATO of a particular position? So, um, you know, we do get uh, onto a bit of an assembly line of uh, preparing these things sometimes without really thinking about, well, what is it that's going to assist the, the decision that needs to be made about the way the provisions should be applied to the facts? Just if, has, if I may come and use the word supervision by the court. Um, one point with the court assist, sometimes it's obvious, sometimes both parties can go the wrong path thinking that they agree on the question which is not relevant. Um, is there any way for the, what, in what, what circumstances the court would help the party supervise the process or supervise the process of experts, the relevance or the questions that put to the experts? Courts are going to rely upon parties to bring to it the issues that exist both at a procedural level and at a determinative level. Um, it's unrealistic to expect a judge to be constantly monitoring the material that's being filed during the course of a matter. If the parties are forming a view that, hey, these We've got a problem here. Our experts are going off on different tangents. At that point, it may be worthwhile asking for a case management hearing, trying to nut out the issue in an open way before the court. But it's a bit unrealistic to expect the judge to babysit the matter without the assistance of the parties being across their own matters. Can you comment on that? Yeah, I mean, I largely everything that Justice Ethan Carmen said earlier about expert reports. The only things I would add, I guess, sometimes it's lost sight of, um, probably worth reiterating, the experts are there to assist the court, not necessarily advocate for either party or parties. Um, and I guess tied into that is um, uh, the notion that I think, and again, applies to both sides, right, the taxpayers and, and the ATO as well, that if, if your expert is expressing views or opinions that are not consistent with the case you want to run, don't just ignore that um, because whether it's through joint reports or cross-examination, um, you know, those sorts of things um, will come out in litigation. So if, if someone's, if your expert if, that you've engaged is saying things to you that don't necessarily fit the case you want to argue, I, I think it might require you to rethink maybe your case rather than just ignore it. Um, and as I said, I think that applies to both sides. So. I think there's one more point that we'll discuss. We don't have a lot of time for that, but interested in eating and just comment in your perspective. And then um, just uh, proving the counterfactual in a GAR, Parkway, DPT, a mild scenario. Any observations on that from your perspective? Um, I don't know that there's anything specific or special about that as opposed to, say, the rest of the case. I mean, part of your part of a taxpayer's case in, a, in, in that sort of anti-avoidance land is about establishing, you know, the commercial rationale behind what actually happened. And that, to a certain extent, is your building block for establishing what a, what might be expected to be the most reasonable alternative. Um, I don't think it's sort of any more complicated than that, at least in theory. <laughs> I understand in practice it gets more complicated. But, you know, um, all the other points about owners for proof equally apply to establishing that first set of facts, right? Like what, what were the commercial environment or the commercial objectives that the taxpayer was intending to meet and or operating under and that I think flows through to 
the analysis about the kind of such is, I don't know, do you disagree, Carmen, or agree? I don't disagree, um, but this is where it, it, it is a challenge, uh, particularly for the cases, to raise it again, such as Milan, uh, where it was um, the case or the transaction occurred, I think, in 2007, um, 2008, uh, and uh, you, know, you have um, people who move on who may have had direct knowledge, even though um, it's, it's important to prove uh, to um, put forward ob objective objective evidence. Um, and this is again where um, preparation uh, or, or thought about um, how to prepare or prove uh, one's case needs to happen a, a long, long time before um, any, you know, even getting an assessment uh, and getting to court because, um, because again, the challenge is for the taxpayer to, who has the onus and they have to gather the facts uh, and put, the, put them for the tax office in, a most, in the most comprehensive way um, because unless you do that, um, it's going to be very difficult to be able to prove what the most reliable um, alternative uh, fact that w would have occurred uh, um, in the absence of what actually happened. And you know, when you think about it, that is kind of an odd concept. And you, you may have a situation such as in Milan where uh, the court preferred a, another um, counterfactual, uh, not uh, which had some factors that were uh, different to to the taxpayers as well as the the commissioner's counterfactual, and she thought that that her preferred counterfactual was the um, the what was the most um, reliable alternative. Um, however. Again, that really is incumbent on the taxpayer to to um, be able to dig into their facts, um, and a very challenging um, exercise, especially where you've got to go back however many years, and you know the records um, or the memory or the recollections that may not be there as to what happened, what the commercial purpose is. However, um, you know, you, you can be assisted by the uh, records that, that the, the company keeps or the taxpayer keeps, and um, but you should not leave that to the uh, hearing before that is captured and, and um, investigated quite separately from you know, how the ATO is conducting their investigation. And I can't stress enough how, it, how important it is for a taxpayer to um, be able to gather um, and present their own facts, um, irrespective of how the ATO is, is gathering those facts from the lens of the ATO's particular hypothesis. It's very important that the taxpayer can independently its story. And one other thing I just wanted to add to what Carmen said was, um, I think we've seen like the best evidence is contemporaneous evidence, right? So, uh, I mean, best, best practice and expectation you would expect in this market that, you know, if you are undertaking a transaction that you think might be scrutinized, to actually have evidence from the start rather than someone having to, you know, think about it. 10, whatever it is, to five, 10 years down the track about why I made that decision. Um, so, yeah, I mean, ideally, um, taxpayers do have that sort of contemporaneous evidence that then hopefully makes things easier. But as we know in practice, that doesn't always pan out. I'm sure there are many reasons for that. But sometimes it's just that people aren't necessarily thinking ahead to beyond what they're immediately doing, I guess. Thanks. Um, I think we have only a few minutes left. Are there any question that Anyone wants to ask? Commissioner Carmen. Um, <laughs> before we conclude, Justice Hess, would you like to make a concluding remark? Um, only 
where I started, which is don't lose sight of who your audience really is and bear in mind what you're asking that individual to do. Play straight back. No dross, no gloss. It's just the fact. A very important message. I think I will conclude. First, I would like to thank the federal court and justice has for today. Thank you very much. And of course, time and meeting. So if you can join me, uh, join, uh, thank you, panel, in the usual way. And this concludes our 2024 IFA, federal court IFA joint event. Thank you very much.